Real quick, if you're on the go a lot but appreciate quality food, today's sponsor, Factor, delivers meals to your door that are ready to eat in two minutes. My promo gets you 50% off your first box, but more on that later. Sails appear as if out of the deep. With a burst of guns, a tide of Englishmen pounds onto the beach. The Spanish flee inland. The English, having failed to conquer Spanish Hispaniola, have come to take this sparsely populated island instead. Spain had claimed Jamaica in the days of Columbus, promptly enslaving the indigenous Taino people. As disease and maltreatment began to kill nearly all of this population, the Spaniards turned increasingly to enslaved Africans. In the chaos of the present invasion, these Africans, roughly 1,500 strong, find themselves free. Spanish stragglers resist the English until about 1660. But the liberated Africans continue to fight from the shadowed woods. The Spanish had called such African and indigenous runaways cimarrones, meaning wild or untamed. The English called them maroons. After some years of bloodshed, the maroons retreat at last into the forested mountains, and the English do not follow. It is recorded that the ways of them became utterly unknown to the white people, and so they continued for many years. In the meantime, the Jamaican coasts become the haunts of buccaneers such as Henry Morgan, who murderously plunder Spanish ports and ships. Clergymen decry the Jamaican city of Port Royal as a profane and ungodly haven for pirates and prostitutes. The great wickedness does indeed enter through the southern docks of Jamaica. Yet it is not the dwindling ranks of buccaneers, but the foul blight of slavery. Withered survivors of the transatlantic voyage are prodded ashore, sold, and forced onto plantations. The enslaved population, which counted 550 Africans in 1662, numbers 45,000 around the turn of the century. Many die from disease and overwork in the scalding, injurious labor of sugar production. And this industry is maintained by heinous violence. One pro-slavery writer notes, for crimes of lesser nature, castration, or chopping off half of the foot with an axe. For negligence, they are usually whipped by the overseer. After they are whipped till they are raw, some put on their skins pepper and salt. Rebellion incurs the punishment of being burned alive slowly. And yet, it is known by all that in the mountains there live those whose very existence defies this order. Runaways and the survivors of frequent slave rebellions have often joined them or formed their own bands in the wilderness. And on occasion, often in the quiet hours of the night, the Maroons return to the plantations. They torch the estates, kill the slaveholders, plunder weapons and supplies, and liberate many of the enslaved into their ranks. For in the Blue Mountains lies a place called Nanny Town, home to hundreds of Maroons. Elements of the traditions and tongues of the mother continent are maintained here in a kind of diasporic West African village. Women plant yams and plantains, and men hunt wild hogs, and their children are born free. The leaders and warriors answer to the spiritual counsel and wisdom of a maroon elder called Nanny. Her town, together with outlying maroon villages, constitute the windward band of maroons. In the west are the Leeward Maroons, under the stern leadership of a man called Kujo. Many Maroons are from the Akan-speaking region of the Gold Coast, first taken captive and sold during wars against rival African coastal powers. Thus, the Maroons are well acquainted with war. They traverse the Jamaican hills with signaling horns, brandishing spears or stolen guns and swords. When British planters expand around the northeast coast in 1722, the Maroons strike. Plantations are burned and deserted. Enslaved Africans are inspired to rebel or run away. Maroon raids continue for years with hardly any retaliation. The British Crown sends regiments of professional soldiers in 1730. But the militia and military alike must face the mountains, where they flounder down false trails into traps, only to be ambushed by Maroons who vanish again into the woods. 
Maroon warfare, slave rebellions, and a correspondingly torpid economy are bleeding the white population. Already around 10 enslaved people to every one white person. At an emergency meeting of the legislature, the governor warns, There never was a point of time which more required your attention to the safety of this island than at present. The British mobilize large parties against both bands of Maroons and capture several settlements, but many of the slaves made to fight for them defect to the Maroons, who regain Nannytown in a counterattack the following year. The underground rebellion is all around the planters, in the trees, in their very homes. The enslaved listen and pass intelligence about British plans to Maroon scouts. The Windward Maroons, themselves oath-sworn in loyalty to Nanny, sense war. 400 troops, including 100 professional soldiers, advance toward Nanny Town. One division moves to block the rear exit, but the Maroons ambush them and chase them off. The remaining 300 march on. The Maroons suddenly appear from behind trees and rocks, shouting, shooting, and massacring the front lines. The hysteric British fall back. Following this triumph, rebellions spring up across the island, and runaways join the Maroons in droves. The legislature of Jamaica concedes that the Maroons have grown in power. To the great terror of His Majesty's subjects, they plundered all around them and caused several plantations to be thrown up and abandoned, to the diminution of His Majesty's revenue. A planter writes that, The rebels got the better of all our parties. Our men dare not look them in the face in the open ground or in equal numbers. But in 1734, a large British force quietly scales the high, narrow path to Nannytown and bombards the huts with small cannons. Maroons flee the burning village. In the ensuing skirmishes, Maroon warriors take the lives of 80 of the attackers. But Nannytown is lost. The Windward Band disperses to other hideouts. Some make a long trek to Kudjo in the west, but the prickly and vigilant chief will not risk harboring those not under his direct authority. He turns them back. And for years there is quiet, the planters recovering some sense of security, until the Windward Maroons resume the fight in 1737. The British, possessing neither the means nor the will to conquer the mountains, resolve to make peace. Representatives first go to Kudjo and the Leeward Band with gifts and hostages. The terms of their proposal grant the Leeward Maroons ownership and authority over all the land around their settlements, 1,500 acres, and the right to hunt almost anywhere and trade in colonial towns. At last, freedom and safety. The price of this victory is that the Leeward Maroons must assist the British in putting down rebellions and invasions, and that from this moment on, any runaway slave who seeks refuge with or encounters the Maroons is to be captured and returned to the slaveholders. Kudjo signs the treaty in 1739. Some of his men revolt at this apparent betrayal of the enslaved. They attempt to foment a rebellion on the plantations, but Kudjo has the leaders of the plot arrested and personally oversees the executions of two of them. Next, the British go with beating drums and fanfare to the place of the Windward Maroons. Nanny's people have long held the British in contempt. One observer notes that their women wear necklaces strung with the teeth of His Majesty's subjects. But the prospect of war against both the British and Kudjo's Maroons effectively forces them to sign a similar treaty. No longer can the enslaved look to the hills for liberation. The British have helped turn their old allies against them and in so doing preserved the slave state. Ships arrive with appalling frequency. The number of enslaved people in Jamaica approaches 300,000 over the course of the century. The cry for freedom grows louder, but massive slave revolts are brutally suppressed with the aid of Maroon warriors. In 1791, the Haitian Revolution begins, a long and cataclysmic slave rebellion. Amid spheres of spreading revolt, British disputes with the Maroons of Kudjo's old village, now called Trelawney Town, devolve into war in 1795. The other Maroon villages will not support Trelawney Town, but runaway slaves join the ranks of the rebels as they did generations ago. Lines of redcoats are decimated by guerrilla warfare. The British lose 70 men in around two months without a confirmed kill of their own. Only scorched earth tactics, burning crops and cutting down forest brush, forced the Trelawney Maroons to accept peace. Yet many are slow to give themselves up. 
and the governor uses this as a pretext to take nearly all of the over 500 inhabitants of Trelawney Town and banish them. The first winter is one of the worst on record. Here in the north, the Maroons are resigned to ramshackle lodgings. For years, the Maroons petitioned the British government to permit them back to Jamaica, to no avail. In 1800, the British allowed them to settle in Sierra Leone, home to many formerly enslaved Africans. A large part of the Trelawney Maroons will remain there for the rest of their lives. But in the 1840s, after the British abolished slavery, some sail with their families to Jamaica. For the eldest among them, it's a return to the island of their childhood. An island of lush mountains where centuries-old maroon communities live on to this day. When Joe's making art like this, or when I'm researching or writing, we're in the flow. I want something that's quick to eat, but not empty or low quality. Factor solves this perfectly. You get a box full of varied, balanced, and nutritious meals. It takes two minutes to prepare, and bam. I had spinach and mushroom chicken thighs first, and it was great. No trip to the grocery store prepping, chopping, or cleanup. Just a quick-to-make, satisfying meal. The meals themselves are fresh and never frozen, and right away you can tell the ingredients are quality. I love that you get 35 meals to choose from each week, so if you have specific diet preferences or goals, you'll find the meals for you. Factor is now owned by another channel sponsor, HelloFresh. I love switching between the brands, and now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use promo code HISTORYDOSE50 for 50% off your first Factor box. 